if you actually ever tried to train a, a bee. Um, <laughs> I train bees for a living, that's my job. I don't make a lot of money, but I sure have a heck of a good time doing it. <laughs> so how does one train a bee? There we go. It's very easy, you can do it in your backyard, on your balcony. All you have to do is to set out a, a sugar water feeder out there, uh, wait for a while, a, a passing bee comes by, a lands, and notices that the food is really good. It goes back home and tells the other bees via its dance, which I'll talk to you about later, that there's some really good stuff over there. Then other bees come to check it out. And of course, pretty soon you've got more and more bees accumulating at, at the feeder over there. And then, of course, you can move the feeder step by step into the lab, and the bees will, of course, follow because sugar is good. And eventually, you can begin to experiment with them. Now, of course, uh, <laughs> this, 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 this number of bees is actually building up exponentially if the food source is very good. And you don't want all the bees in the hive to be visiting you. Because there's about 40,000 bees in a hive. And of course, you've got to keep your experiment under control. So the way you keep this experiment under control is once you've got the bees coming inside, you put an additional feeder outside in the balcony. This is a decoy feeder, which has much weaker sugar solution. So what happens is that the new recruits that come on there come and, and land on this most obvious outside source, which turns out to be a rather weak, flat solution. And they say, ah, false alarm. This is not good. This is just a, you know, not what it's cracked up to be. So they get disappointed go away, and don't come back again, right? So it's only the bees that know the secret of where the good stuff is that keep coming to you again and again inside the lab, all right? So now, once you've got this sort of captive cohort of bees, by the way, I shouldn't say captive cohort, because they're coming there of their own free will. <laughs> There's no coercion. The only reason why they're coming to you is because the food that you're offering to them is much better than what they could get outside. OK, that's the only reason why they're coming in. OK, you can then individually mark them, color code them if you want, while they're drinking the sugar water. They're very peaceful, by the way. Bees, when they're in a foraging state of mind, they're actually very peaceful. You can reach over and stroke them while they're drinking. So they're, they're lovely creatures. So, so you, can, you can color code them individually, follow their individual learning performance, if you will, and so on. OK, what, what, what can you do with these bees now that you've got a cohort of bees? For example, can bees learn to fly through mazes and labyrinths? Uh, we know that humans can, or at least most humans can. Uh, we know that rats and mice can. Lots of experiments have been done with that. But can a lowly insect learn to navigate its way through a maze? Well, you can do this very simply. Here's this, for example, the thing where the bee has to actually come in this entrance here and then fly through this array of boxes. Some of these boxes have more than one exit, so it has to work out which exit is the right one and find its way to the end and goal there where it actually finds a, a reward, right? Now, in this first kind of experiment, we, we, we make life simple for the bees. We give them a hint. And the hint is to follow a green tag placed at each one of these exits. So it gets to go to the goal by learning to follow the green tag. So every chamber where there's two, two exits, one of them, the green tag labels the correct exit, and the other one is obviously the wrong exit. So you can train a bee step by step by taking a sugar water feeder and placing it step by step through this thing, taking them through all the way to the end. The training takes about a half a day, and at the end of it, they learn this thing beautifully. This, this the histogram here, don't worry about the details there, but it's showing you that these bees are actually performing with very few errors. And the next slide shows you a video of a bee going through. This happens very fast, so you'll have to see it. See that it's following the green tag? It zips right through and, and gets to the goal. There we go. That was about, what, six or seven seconds? So. Um, once a bee has learned that the name of the game is to follow the green tag, you can take her through any other maze. A novel maze, she just learns to follow the green tag. You can even make her go round and round in circles in the maze if you want to, but we never do that. That should be just too cruel. <laughs> we never do that. OK, now here's a slightly more abstract ta task here. In this one, the bee is not simply dumbly following the green tag. It's got an abstract signpost that it has to read and understand. So in this case, in this case, the bee enters each one of these chambers, and it sees a, a color in the back wall. And if this color is blue, it means the bee has to turn right. And if it's yellow, she has to turn left. OK, this is a very abstract, symbolic representation uh, of a navigational route through the maze. Can bees learn to do this? And it turns out they can. In fact, they perform just as well as in the earlier task. They learn the task just as rapidly, and they perform just as well, which is pretty amazing, I think. OK, here's the, uh, the, the next class, which is even more complicated. And, and this, of course, is the classical unmarked maze, where you have no cues whatsoever. You really have to learn the route. 
step by step as you are taken through the maze with the feeder uh, and, and learn you know, the right turns and the left turns as you go through. And bees can learn this too, uh, not as well as in the other cases where they've been given you know, guideposts and signs, uh, but certainly they're performing much better than, than, than random chance. But what is interesting is that this is the only situation where the bees actually learn the route through the maze. Okay? In all of the other cases, for example, if you start by training bees to follow a green tag, and you then remove the green tag, the bees are completely lost. They have no idea where to go. In that way, bees are very human, because let's say you're driving somewhere, and your passenger is navigating. You never learn the route, do you? So bees are very human in that way. They're like us. So they learn things only when they're forced to learn. Otherwise, they rely on whatever other aids they have available to them. Here's another kind of experiment you can do. I don't know if some of you have already seen this kind of image before. But if you look at this image, what can you see? Uh, you can probably see the young lady out there. Uh, you can see these birds out there. You can see the distant mountains. But if you look a little more carefully, you might see this flute here, and maybe these fingers and the two hands out here, and eventually maybe the face. Does everyone see it now? So once you've seen this picture and, and, and detected these hidden objects, you will never look at this image in the same way again. Every time this picture is presented to you later on in the future, your, your brain will immediately, immediately grasp onto all these hidden objects and locate them right away. So we've got this amazing uh, um, process called top-down processing, where once the, bee, the, once the brain knows what it wants to see, it will reach down there and pull out the signal even when it's buried in noise. Okay? So we've got this amazing thing called top-down processing, prior knowledge and how it aids recognition. So do lonely creatures like insects and bees also have this thing called top-down processing? And you can look at this uh, in an experiment like this, where you train bees to come into a, what's known as a Y maze, where they have a choice between two different visual stimuli, both of which are now camouflaged. One of them, as you can see in the top panel, is actually a textured ring presented against a similarly textured background, because you can't see it because it's camouflaged. <laughs> But actually, actually it, it, it's got that shape. Okay? And, and the other one is a textured disk presented against a textured background. Okay? Now, you can try and train bees to see if they can distinguish between these two stimuli by rewarding them uh, on, for example, the ring. And you can train them for as long as you like. You can train them for until the cows come home, five days, which is a long time in the life of a bee because bees don't live for more than a couple of weeks. They will never learn this task. Okay? However, if you start by giving them a hint, and you train them on these un uncamouflaged versions of these two stimuli, they will learn this very fast. Now, see, they learn to go this thing to the, to the ring very quickly. And then, when you expose them to the camouflage stimuli, bingo, immediately they've got it. So, prior knowledge, which is instilled in these bees, tells them what to look for and how to break the camouflage. And once they've learned to break the camouflage, you can even give them new patterns. For example, this is a horizontal bar. That's a vertical bar, which you again cannot see. But once they've known the secret of breaking the camouflage, they can move on to new objects and work with them almost immediately. So you can train bees to look at the world in new ways, which we never thought we could do. So these bees are actually pretty smart. OK, another, another, another thing. Um, when you look at this image, uh, do you smell lemon? It worked for me. It's associated with recall. You know? There's this powerful association that we have. Uh, for example, it's a bit like you know, if you listen to a piece of music, it might remind you of something you were doing a long time ago in high school. Or if you get a whiff of perfume or cologne, it might remind you of someone you knew a long time ago but don't necessarily want to talk about anymore. <laughs> associated recall is a, is a very powerful phenomenon. It's there in all of us. And the question is, is it there in these lowly creatures, bees as well? And does it help them in any way in their everyday life? So um, to look at that, uh, we look to see whether a whiff of scent can trigger a memory of a previously visited place uh, in a bee. So the experiment is actually very simple. We place a, a sugar water feeder scented with the scent of rose in a particular location um, in a garden. And we train bees. Uh, to come and visit it. Uh, uh, with these bees are individually marked, so we know which bee is which and which one's visiting that feeder. And then we take that feeder away and then place another feeder um, at a different location uh, laced with the scent of lemon. And the same bees are now trained to visit that feeder. 
And then we alternate back and forth. Every time the feeder is in, in, in this location, it has the scent of lemon. And every time the feeder is in this other location, it has the scent of rose. We want to know whether bees can associate the scent with a particular feeder location. Okay? So we do this experiment. We train them for a couple of, day, a couple of days. And then we go away for the weekend. Uh, uh, the bees, by the way, uh, the bees don't uh, go away for the weekend. They continue to work. Uh, they don't have our feeders there, but they visit other sites during the meantime. But come Monday morning, we're back there at our experimental station. It's, it's very cool. It's early in the morning. There's no bee traffic at all. No bees coming out. We, 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 place, uh, we place two feeders now, two dummy feeders now. These are no real, not real feeders, they're dummy feeders. There's one empty feeder uh, where the former rose feeder used to, rose scented feeder used to be. It's empty and it has no scent, okay? And there's another feeder here where the former lemon feeder used to be. It's also empty, no food, no scent. And then we simply blow rose scent into the hive here. There's no traffic, but as soon as we blow the rose scent, these moth bees that we had trained emerge from the hive. And most of them end up looking for food where the former rose feeder used to be. On the other hand, if you now blow lemon scent into the hive, the same bees emerge. And this time, most of them end up looking where the former lemon feeder used to be. So clearly, what's cool about this experiment is that, remember, in the test, there's no scent of the feeder, there's no food. All we're doing is injecting a scent in the hive. And the scent is triggering memories, recall, of where that, where that food was. So I know what that is. That's the rose <laughs> scented thing. That's where it ought to be. Oops, what happened there? And they shoot off right away there. Um, so be, even lowly bees have very complex associative recall, which helps them navigate and find food sources very reliably. Now, if we could run this video, how does this help them in their real life? As many of you probably know, uh, bees that have found a good food source, come back and do this famous waggle dance. Um, this is where this, this mark bee now is doing this waggle. Every time she comes down at this angle, oblique angle there, and the duration of this waggle is telling the other bees how far away the food source is, and the orientation of the waggle axis is telling them what direction they should fly in with respect to the sun to get to the food source. So I would say, looking at this dance, that the food source is about 500 meters away, <laughs> and about 120 degrees away from the sun. So if you look some time later, you will find this bee at a particular bush right over there. But what is neat about this, and you don't see this, see this in this particular video, is that quite often you, you see, see other cohorts of bees hanging around this dancing bee, and they're actually begging her for nectar samples. So every so often this dancing bee will stop and, and pass out nectar samples to the other bees, potential recruits, and they can decide for themselves whether it's really worthwhile going there or not to get to the food, right? So that's what's happening over there. So if a bee happens to pass on a, 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 a sample of nectar, which the other bee recognizes in terms of its scent, then the other bee will say, aha, I know where that is. You know, I don't really need this dance information. I've been there before. Boom, off she goes. So this additional information on top of the dance information will expedite the journey to the food source and, of course, enable the hive to collect honey, honey much, more, much more efficiently. But not only this, there's some really cool stuff done by, by uh, James Near, sorry, I didn't mean to start the video again, but we can have it if you like. Um, uh, James Near, uh, and it's called danger. He found that bees can actually signal danger. So let's say a bee is dancing over here and advertising a particular food source, and another bee watching this dance has actually experienced danger at, the food, at that food source in terms of a spider, for example, lurking over there, and they uh, try to fight with that spider. Okay, that other bee will headbutt this dancing bee and stop it from dancing. <laughs> How about that? I mean. And, and this, and, uh, and this headbutting is very specific to that particular food source. So if the bee is signaling some other food source at some other location, there is no headbutting. It's only for that particular food source, that dangerous food source. Now, how about that? That's amazing. But this might just stop and think, these creatures are not just simple, reflexive, dumb automatons. They really are thinking creatures. And they deserve a lot of respect. All right? Now, if you, if you, look, at the, the, if you look inside the brain of an insect, they seem to have all of the essential building blocks. Uh, of higher creatures like vertebrates and us. For example, if we can run that video, um, you should be able to run that video. They have an antenna lobe, which is very, very much like the olfactory lobe in our, in our, in our cells. It, it, there's neurons there that analyze sense. Um, there's the medulla, which has neurons very much like our own cortical visual neurons. Uh, there's the lobula, which has uh, circuits that analyze the color of objects and the movement of uh, scenes. Um, and there are the mushroom bodies, 
which make associations between color and scent and so on, and they're very much like our hippocampus. They also have a spatial map that allows them to navigate, very much like the hippocampus in, that we have. So all of the essential ingredients uh, that, you know, that, uh, that our brains have are essentially there in these simple creatures, and they have just a million neurons, a fewer than a million neurons, whereas we have a million million neurons, right? So all of the fundamental processes of cognition can probably be analyzed much more easily by looking at these creatures that obviously have simpler neural circuits. Uh, the next frontiers, in my opinion anyway, with studying these beautiful creatures is um, can simple creatures experience emotions? So, for example, we know that bees are aggressive, but does that translate into anger when they're trying to defend their hive? Um, can bees experience joy? Uh, you can, for example, condition bees just the way you'd condition the Pavlovian dog. Uh, dogs can be conditioned to you know, salivate in response to a ringing bell. If they, you know, if they, if they learn to associate that ring with, a, with, a, with food. And similarly, you can condition a bee to extend its proboscis, its tongue, in response to a scent puffed at it when it expects a food reward to come later on. So there could be this anticipation when it's been trained, anticipation of the reward. So do they have anticipation? You can measure heart rate, by the way, in these bees. Bees have a heart. You can actually measure their heart rate and see if that goes up when there's anticipation. There's joy when you get the food. Can you measure some physiological correlate of joy? Uh, there's disappointment when the expected food does not get delivered, right? The, all of these things can be tested by measuring physiological parameters, I think. Uh, there's also, for example, fear. You can condition them to expect an electric shock after a certain sense has been delivered. So do you, what happens then? Do you get an increase in heart rate? What happens then? All, the things, all these things, I think, can be studied. And I wouldn't be surprised if even simple creatures do display some level of, of emotion. Finally, the other interesting question, of course, is can simple creatures uh, experience pain? I mean, both you and I would agree that if you, if you jab a dog and it flinches, you say, okay, it's got pain. But if you jab an insect and it shows the same kind of response, you say, ah, that's just a reflex. Are we really sure about that? Or are we just kidding ourselves? Thank you.